Today's special guest is Joshua McMillan. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in writing? Yeah, so I I consider myself a horror and dark fiction author. Um, I write, my, my fiction ten isn't like, super extreme but it does it does lean a little splattered at times um personally i am a lifelong diehard fan of the genre my introduction to it was film i grew up watching the old slasher movies of the 80s so stuff like friday the 13th and halloween and texas chainsaw massacre that's kind of my bread and butter yeah um let's see i am married i live in wisconsin in the united states and i have five children and my writing i've been writing for about 10 years or so steadily but i've always been uh, a creative person Um, and i always knew that i wanted to do whatever i did creatively i wanted to I wanted it to be genre specific. I wanted it to be horror. And I only recently, like I said, like 10 years ago or so, decided that I would try my hand at writing. That's fantastic. So is there any particular subgenre that you write in or is it just horror in general? Horror in general, but slasher. Slasher is my favorite. Slasher is a sweet spot for me. Um, my most popular book is more torture porny, but, um, my, mo- my latest book is probably my favorite one that I've written. And that one is very much a tribute to Halloween. Brilliant. So tell us a little bit about your books. Well, I've got three, three, uh, I guess, standalone releases. And what I mean by that is, you know, I've got a full length novel. I've got a uh, novella out and then I guess you could call it a novelette, maybe a short novella uh, that is a, a collaboration with another indie author called Megan Stockton. Yeah. Um, that's the Halloween tribute one. And that's, uh, that's the first entry into what we're hoping will be either. Well, I think it'll be a trilogy, but we're we're just hoping to get the the rest of this first story out before the end of you know next year. Yeah. Um. There was it was originally supposed to be a much longer piece for that one, and what we ended up releasing is we call it like our tribute to the first six minutes of the original Halloween film where young Michael kills Judith that inciting incident for the character of the shape. Um, This first book is our version of that moment in this slasher's life that we're writing. And then the rest of the book, it was going to be a novel told in two parts. And the second part of the book was going to be the main narrative, very much like the original Halloween, how it flashes forward 15 years and you're following uh, Laurie Strode. We're going to have that sort of vibe going. But the time constraints that we put on ourselves kind of got away from us, and we decided to release this first little bit as a standalone just to kind of gauge the interest. Um, and so far, it's been it's been very well received, and we're looking forward to jumping in on it. And it's also – that is the first, the first thing in what we're calling our Violent Indulgences series – and yeah. it's that series is basically her and I doing collaborations that pay tribute to our favorite films, favorite film franchises that we grew up watching. So it'll, it'll be our our takes on like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, or you know, not carbon copying what they did, but kind of using those as templates, so to say. Yeah, I get um, what you mean. My debut novel was released through uh, indie publisher DNT Publishing. 
That one is called The Best of Intentions. That is not extreme. It has some extreme moments in it, or some one I wouldn't even necessarily say extreme. I'd say severe moments. Of, but it, it, it deals with the horrors of PTSD and paranoia. And it's more psychological. Yeah. But then, like I said earlier, my most popular book is um, more torture porny, and that's The Death House. And that book is I, I played with the with the stereotypical tropes of, you know, the five friends who go off and they get, you know, knocked off one by one. And then you got the final girl. Uh, I really wanted to lean into those tropes with that book. And yeah. so far, that's that's been my most popular. Brilliant. And aside from that, I've got a handful of short stories available. Uh, one one that I just released all on its own. That's just for free. Uh, I believe it's on God list right now. Um, and then the others are all collected in various anthologies. Fantastic. So what was the first horror story that you ever wrote and what inspired it? The first horror story that I ever wrote was actually, so my debut novel, the best of intentions originated as a short story and it's actually the very first short story that i ever completed i had tried and failed numerous times to to complete a, a writing project like all of us do when we're first starting and that was the first one that i completed and it was because i had basically sort of stumbled my way into getting the pitch for the idea accepted by a small publishing house based out of Hawaii to be collected in an anthology. Yeah. So with the with the hypothetical gun to my head, you know, I had to finish it. And when it was all said and done, I, I wasn't ever very satisfied with it or completely satisfied with it. So I knew that once I got the rights back to it, I would want to retool it some, make, flesh it out, make it better. I figured I might be able to get a novella out of it and self-publish it. And then that turned into a novel. So essentially the first piece that I ever wrote started its life as a short story and then actually ended up becoming my first novel. That's a cool that's brilliant. Well done. So walk, walk us through your process for developing a story idea. So where do you normally get your ideas from? Well, they, they kind of come from everywhere. Um, but what I like to do is, is, I mean, there's nothing new out there. There's nothing new under the sun. So I like to look back at what I really enjoy and what stories I've really enjoyed reading or watching unfold. And I try to think about different ways to combine it with another story that I liked or how I might have done this different or that different. You know, what order would I kill these people in if I were making this movie or how would I unveil, you know, this death or this twist? Um, and I kind of just start thinking about that. I normally don't plot things out. I will sit down from page one and just write, but I'm finding the, the, the more that I write, the more beneficial, um, some plotting is for me personally. Um, the last book that I wrote, the collaboration with Megan that one i had written like the majority of the story just from page one just completely pantsing it and then when i sent it to her to get her opinion and basically kind of try to sweet talk her into finishing it with me um her and i started doing brainstorming sessions and talking about different things and it became a more organic kind of verbal outlining process that we went through. And then we just kind of went back and forth. She would write some, I would write 
some and we just kind of write over each other and then just kind of flesh out what the other was doing um yeah on a book like death house that one that one was another one that i pantsed but it was also uh it also like best of intentions originated as a short story a completely different short story than what it what it is now it was more of a it was a creature feature originally and it turned into something something completely different but uh the process there was it it was it was kind of weird because i had the short story which was right around 14,000 words and i was doing a page one rewrite just kind of retyping everything up and uh adding in different things flashing it out thinking that i was going to follow the same story path but then it veered off into a completely different direction and i just kind of chased that rabbit um as far as actual process as far as like putting together a manuscript or anything like that i generally do everything by the keyboard i don't longhand anything Uh, i'd like to um but i don't have the patience to do longhand and then sit here and retype it up i'd much rather just type everything up the first round and what i do is i will type up the story you know i'll say for today i haven't written yet today but after we get off this call i'm going to spend about an hour with my family and then i'm going to come in here and i'm going to write for about an hour and i can usually get you know six to eight hundred words in an hour and i'll write that tonight and then tomorrow when i sit down to write i will go back over what i wrote today and edit it so i kind of edit as i go yeah so by the by the time i type the end i almost have a second draft edited manuscript um but then i'll print that off and i'll read it and i'll mark it mark the physical the printout and then I'll go back through on my computer and I'll delete all the original manuscript and I will retype everything. It kind of seems ridiculous to do that, but for some reason it's kind of like a ritual for me. And it forces me to pay attention to every single word as I'm retyping it into a fresh document. And I've found ways, like completely fresh ways of doing a scene by following that process that you know just took me by a complete surprise even even though it's essentially the same scene just kind of the way that i lay it out almost and there's something about the process of reading it and then transferring it and typing it and then trying something new and then combining them that i it, it just really makes the makes the process feel much more smooth and natural to me doing it that way yeah and then by that time that's a third draft and then i typically send it to my editor and she she cuts it up tears it to pieces (laughs) don't they all (laughs) yes so how do you go about creating a compelling character for your horror stories I try to focus on one character. Um, I want all of my characters to feel real, but I will try to focus mostly on one character, two at the most. Um, and my my thinking behind that is it's one person reading this book, and I want them to identify with that one person solely, because that's you know in, in my case if I'm writing slasher. I'm generally going to be putting a lot of effort and focus into the final, final person, final boy, final girl, whatever it is. Yeah. So I want the reader to invest in that person. Um, I try to focus on, I don't, I don't ever want to linger too long on, you know, something unless it's very, very pertinent to the story at hand. But I try to, ensure that I'm bringing in enough backstory in a natural way that 
it fleshes them out. I, of course, like all other writers, I try to key in on those sensory details, um, the emotional details, you know, what, what's really going on in the scene. How is it truly affecting this person? Um, but the big thing for me is I just want the person to feel real. I want, I want it to feel like you're sitting down next to, you know, Lori Strode and you are seeing every wrinkle in her face twitch when she's, you know, reliving the, the night of Halloween. Um, yeah. But I, I tend to do it the first drafts, like, like everybody else, like all other writers, any other honest writer will tell you the first draft generally sucks. Um, so my second drafts, I find a lot of the stuff that I try to key in on is that character development. I've gotten a lot better with that as time has gone by, but there's always room for improvement on that. And I just, I just try to try to make sure that I'm being honest. You know, if I'm writing about, and, and, and I, I, I do look back at things that the popular authors have said, like Stephen King, he always talks about writing what you know. So the, I tend to lean, lean into that. I, you'll never, well, never say never, but you won't find me writing about like this dental hygienist who really loves their job. I don't know. I'm not a dental hygienist. I don't know that job. So yeah. like how King writes about teachers, you know, I don't, I don't know that profession, so I couldn't tell that honestly. But I guess that's where like research would come in and all that. But I don't really have time for too much in-depth research like that unless it's something historical. Cool. Um, I just, I, I guess honesty, that's a long-winded way of saying I just try to be honest through, through the character, try to make them have their own voice. Brilliant. So you said that you don't have time really to do too much in-depth research unless it's historical. So how would you approach something if you didn't really know the ins and outs of it? Um. Well, for the, luckily in, in 2023, I mean, all of us, have Google at her finger, fingertips. And I know that that's a big, huge resource. Uh, I try to stay away from, from stuff that can be easily edited by anybody like Wikipedia, things like that. Yeah. But if I don't know, so if I'm researching something, it's gotta be for something specific. Like my first, my first book, best of intentions, there's some, some gun, details and things like that and i'm i'm fairly i was military i'm fairly familiar with firearms but you know i would go back and just double check and google hey okay does this gun operate this way you know how would this you know what are the stats of this and blah 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 um but mostly just google searching um i do have uh friends and associates that i that i talk to um, there's a, a police officer that I'm friends with that I've been able to utilize and question him, like with the other, which is the collaboration with Megan, when we were talking about how the police would respond to the situation at the end of the book. Um, I was able to sit down with him and kind of talk, okay, hey, what, what does, what can you tell me? that doesn't, you know, because I don't know what is confidential, what's not confidential. So mm -hmm. how how would you respond if you heard this call come over the radio? So I was able to I I was able to talk with him and and kind of glean some some insight as to how he and the department that he works for would actually realistically approach this situation. You know, does one person ever go into the house alone? Does 
do you wait for backup? Do you, you know, at what point do you pull your firearm? Little things like that is what I'm more worried about researching. Um, that and, you know, factual things like, you know, if it's time period specific, there was in, in that book, the other, we actually found a, a little flub that myself, Megan, and our editor missed about um, a piece of technology being utilized in this certain time frame or at this in this time because the book takes place in the 90s and the phone that was being used wasn't actually invented or wasn't widely available at that time so that was a little mistake that we had made um so little things like that i i try to go out of my way now to make sure that i'm getting the facts right yeah so, so just that's... a quick question sorry yeah. i do apologize i know i do apologize you carry on oh no 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 actually um i i was i was i was done you can go ahead <laughs> Sorry. Okay. What I was going to ask was, how does your policeman friend take all these questions? Does he ever raise any concerns that he thinks you're going to do something? Yeah. Yeah. I, I preface this. I, so first of all, he knows, he knows I'm a writer and he knows that I write horror. Yeah. And I was like, I kind of prefaced the conversation with, Hey, can I ask you, you know, a couple of questions about, this sort of event um and procedures and he was like yeah sure whenever and we set up a time and we met up and he was well he was more than willing and able to sit down and ask me or not ask me but let me ask him some questions and chew his brain a little bit um he did think it was a little odd whenever i was asking him hey so as a police officer <laughs> if you walked into this scenario and you find somebody with their head half decapitated and their face half melted off you know what would you how do you think you would you you would handle that uh, he kind of gave me a weird look but he answered <laughs> the question you know he said that he would call for you know medical support and move on from there securing the scene that's fantastic the fact that you've got somebody like that that you can actually speak to and get advice from is is, is amazing yeah it's it's a blessing for sure so are there any characters or plots inspired by your own experience or fears um the best of intentions is probably my most personal uh, only because I was military and it does follow uh, a United States Army veteran who is dealing with PTSD. I personally don't have PTSD, but I have a lot of friends and a lot of family who, who struggle with that. Um, and there are some personal stories uh, from my time in the military that I was able to uh, throw into that book. Um I think every every one of my books to some degree has has something personal. I think every writer puts puts something of themselves in each work that they do. And yeah. the same thing with the every every character that that a creative creates, you know, it's a part of them to some degree. Um which which is really interesting when you go to think about, you know, some of the nasty characters that we create you know the the guys that we would love to see thrown through a meat grinder because they're a misogynist or you know maybe the the white supremacist that you know Stephen King writes about or whatever you know I kind of not saying I'm not saying that you know Stephen King is racist I'm just saying there is certain elements of us that we allow to come come more into view when we're writing those characters and we allow ourselves to go into those places and explore those ideals when we're writing those characters. And there's, there's gotta be some sort of subconscious, you know, meaning or element to it that, you know, is just kind of seeping, whether it be from 
just being around certain lifestyles and environments when we're growing up that maybe we um, pushed back and hid away. I don't know. Um, it's it's interesting. I find it interesting, at least. Yeah, it, it is quite interesting. A lot of authors do say that they sort of like um, draw from their own experiences or they write about their own fears in the work. It helps the stories feel a little bit more realistic and more relatable for the readers. Yes. Okay, so what's the most difficult story or scene that you've ever had to write and why was it challenging? Um, the most difficult scene that I've ever had to write was in, was, was the ending, well, I don't know, it's kind of a toss-up for me because on one hand, I want to say the ending of The Best of Intentions was one of the hardest things I've ever had to write because of what happens. But then, on the other hand, I I want to mention a chapter from the Death House. That's probably the most violent thing that I've published. Um, so it, it'd be a toss-up between those two. I don't know how in-depth or, you know, like, quote-unquote, spoilery we want to go. No, obviously we don't want to let any, out any spoilers. So why was it challenging for you? The content. Um, so the, the ending of the best of intentions, or well, throughout the course of the best of intentions, you're you're kind of following this character called Corey, who is receiving these notes, and the notes are kind of like he he begins to realize it's a countdown to something, but he doesn't know what. And about midway through the book. I intentionally lay out what is happening. And at that point on, it's like watching a car wreck and you know, what's going to happen. So it's more emotional horror. You're watching this, this horrible thing unfold and you know that there's nothing you can do to stop it. Yeah. Um, so that was very, very hard. Um, that, that plays with, you know, the, when I pitch the book at conventions, I pitch it with, you know, this book deals with PTSD and paranoia. And it asks the question, how far would you go to protect the people you love? But then what if you were wrong? And it plays, it, it leans into the mistakes that we can make by jumping to conclusions too quickly. So the ending of that book without giving away what happens well, it's it's gut wrenching and yeah. and it's gut wrenching because there's you know what's going to happen and you know what he's going to do and all you can do is turn the page and watch him do it um, the death house was was content um, I'm not opposed to extremely brutal or violent content but um, I'm not a fan of uh, rape torture. But the scene, in, the scene that I'm talking about involves a female in that sort of situation that yeah. uh, was just very, very... It, I went to a very dark place whenever I wrote that. And I, after writing it and sending it, you know, my editor was praising the book. She thinks it's like the best thing I've written aside from best of, she was, she was, she is like the biggest champion behind best of intentions, but she, she, uh, she told me that death house was going to be something special. And, uh, she, she told me that, uh, she, you know, she just praised it. She was, constantly praising praising it and said that hey i don't think you went too far whereas i was very concerned um i was about as concerned about it as a lot of authors get if they kill a dog in their book you know they're yeah. so concerned about being canceled or killing fido that you know they might want to cut the scene um 
I was I was concerned about that scene. But I just listened to it on audio. Um, I'm finalizing the audio book for it right now. And I got the audio files back from the narrator and I was re-listening to it. And I just, it took me back to when I wrote it. And it, it is, it goes there, but it's not as brutal as I, I had felt it was in the moment. And I think it's because I had, I had allowed my mind to kind of get the better of me. Yeah. But I, I still think that, um, it's it's again like I said it's a toss up between those two it, it, but with that one it it was it was the content um, I I can watch you know films like I Spit on Your Grave or Last House on the Left or anything like that um, I mean a Serbian film comes to mind um, it's not my favorite thing to watch but uh, and I never thought that I would write anything that involved that sort of situation. But sorry if you heard that. That was my daughter slamming my office door. She's quite upset nice. with me right now. Um, <laughs> she she wants to come in every time I'm talking with somebody and say hi and chit chat and watch the video. And I told her it's not on video. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, back to the back to the question. Um, I never thought I would write anything like that, um, but. It felt the most natural. The original scene for that just felt clunky and kind of just disjointed. Whereas that one, while it comes out of nowhere, it feels like it actually fits the book. And it yeah. really kind of, especially when you when you look at the cover and you, you read the back cover and you have read up to this point, you know what the book is going to be. It really kind of cranks, cranks the book into high gear with the scene being in there, raises the stakes. And I wouldn't change it now for anything, but it took me by surprise. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Some of those scenes, um, they have to fit the book, don't they? If they don't fit the book, then it's just been put in there for no reason at all, just for a shock exactly. value. Exactly. Okay. So have you got any exciting projects that you're currently working on that you can share with us? Well, um, I I was, and I say was in the past since, unfortunately, uh, the contracts have dissolved. But I was slated to have two more novels uh, coming out over the next two years. Um, but neither of them were, were finished. Neither of them were ready to go to the editor yet. So it's kind of a blessing in disguise to have those contracts dissolved. Um, mm. And it'll allow me to really put more time into it and make sure that they're where they need to be. Um, I do have a short story due at the end of the month, and that's what I'm working on uh, the rest of this week. I'm hoping to finish that up and then get that off to uh, Megan, basically, re Megan Stockton, who I wrote other with. She basically reads everything that I write, and my editor, Mary Danner, she reads everything that I write, of course. And I'm hoping to get that off to them by the end of this weekend and get their yeah. feedback on it. And then that'll go. That that was an invitation. Um, I'm not sure if I can announce what I can announce about it. What I can say is it's water themed. Um, somebody's doing a, a an anthology that's themed on Terrors of the Deep. And mine is kind of a kind of a tropey slash creature from the Black Lagoon type of story. Yeah. And then other than that, right after that, I'm going to jump into uh, completing the other with Megan. Now that these the two contracted books have dissolved, um, I'm going to get the next couple of collaborations with Megan knocked out. And we're hoping to release those, like I said, by the end of next year. Um, you should see one, at least two, if not three, releases from the two of us 
And I'll also at the same time be working on honing those two other books and getting those done. Um, what I can say about those is one is a domestic abuse um, revenge type of story called Till Death Do We Part. And then the other is a coming of age slasher called Devil's Night that takes place in a small town. It's small town horror, coming of age slasher. And it's kind of like if you if if you think Stranger Things or It or any any sort of coming of age story that deals with bullied kids, and then you throw hints of you know teens taking revenge on their bullies and then throw a serial killer in the mix. That's kind of what that book is. Yeah. Fantastic. So I wish you the best of luck with all of those projects that you've got going on at the moment. Sounds like you've got a Thank lot you. going on. I yeah, I hope. I hope uh I hope it continues. I hope the the ideas seem to always be coming and I just hope that the the passion just steadily keeps climbing in and just maintains. I was able to attend um AuthorCon in Virginia this uh, AuthorCon 2. I don't know if you've heard of that. But um going there and being amongst other authors and other successful authors was very very invigorating but then i ended up hitting this massive slump because imposter syndrome is a very real thing and uh i'm kind of getting back into the swing of things and um i've been working steadily i'm hoping that everybody will see a lot more coming from me right on a regular basis brilliant so what advice have you got for aspiring writers who want to break into the horror genre? Well, everybody always says to write or read, but I'm I'm going to say uh, make friends. Don't be afraid to reach out to that author that you read, that you like, that you admire. Chances are you'll, you'll be able to chat with them on Facebook Messenger or Instagram or wherever. We are all over the place because we're trying to sell our sell our work get our get our books in people's hands my advice would be to reach out to those people talk to them tell them how much you you admire their work how much you enjoy their work strike a friendship because when you are reading and when you are writing and you're ready to publish you know blurbs help and if you made that sort of you know strong connection that's not just oh my god i'm such a huge fan or you know anything you you create this this real honest bond um you can get a blurb and that'll do wonders for your book you know um they'll also you'll also have a better shot at maybe one of your favorite authors being willing to take a look at it and give you feedback from their viewpoint on it and let you know what what they think and what how they would you know maybe edit this paragraph or um you know just anything like that so network networking with uh the authors that you that you admire and you enjoy that would be my my advice that's what's worked for me um especially in the indie horror scene. We, we are a small, tight-knit community, and so long as you're not an asshole or a fucking douchebag, we will we'll be more than happy to talk with you. That's right. I mean, they're all, a, they're all a very friendly bunch. I mean, I've never been able to network at all. No, I've I'm, always I'm terrible at it, it but it... it doesn't take much to sell like i mean you messaged me out of the blue yeah um, that was coming out of my comfort zone completely when i started yeah. doing this podcast and, <laughs> and, it, you, and you know you're the you're the first person that has just you know reached out you know and asked hey do you want to be interviewed for this so, uh yeah i do that would be awesome you know it's just you know yes it's going to take stepping out of your comfort zone but you got to take that leap of faith. I mean, 
other if you if you're not willing to take a, a small leap of faith like reaching out to your favorite author or this editor that you admire or this cover artist that you like to try to get them to do your book i mean you're not going to take a a leap of faith on publishing your book yeah. at least i don't think you will i mean no. you you might press pub, publish on kdp but i don't think you're going to I don't think you'll go far. Not if you haven't networked. Not if you haven't done that homework. That's it's, right. It's, it takes an army to lift up one book. I mean, Death House for me is my most popular. It's because of the blurbs that I got for it. I mean, I got Ronald Kelly and Daniel Volpe to blurb it. And Megan Stockton to blurb it. Cage Greenwood to blurb it. And all of those guys they shared the book they shared every post that i was making and they they were pitching it to their readers you know so that's how you get eyes on your work so you need to network that would be my biggest piece of advice reach out to any one of us if even if you haven't read my my work and you have questions you can reach out to me i am so easy to get a hold of yeah, it's, it is right, though. Networking is a very big, big part of anything, isn't it, these days, especially with the, yeah. the, the how we've come with technology and everything like that. It's, it's easy to do, but it's having the confidence to do it as well. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so where can your listeners find um, your books? Oh, well, it depends on what format. If 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 you are an ebook reader, everything that I have available is on KU. Um, it is available internationally on KU. It is available um, through Amazon, of course. Um, I believe you can order Best of Intentions through the DNT Publishing website. Um, but I do have an online store of my own through Big Cartel. We just go to www.joshuamcmillan.com. Through there, you can purchase signed paperbacks of everything that I have available. Um, other than that, I do have uh, the best of intentions is also available on Audible, but I think that's tied in. Yeah, that is. It's tied in with Amazon anyways. So... Amazon is probably the most accessible, wi widely accessible. Yeah. But if you're looking for paperbacks, signed paperbacks specifically, you can go to my website or you can just reach out to me directly as well. And we can work that out, too. But I know oh, I've been re I'll, I'll get messages from people, you know, over in the UK or I got I got a guy from Sweden who reached out wanting best of intentions, but the shipping on it was like forty something bucks. I couldn't bring I couldn't bring myself to make him pay forty something dollars to ship the book. Yeah, it's expensive, isn't it, to ship things yeah. overseas these days? Right. Well it's been a pleasure, Joshua, to have you on the show. So thank you very much for accepting my offer. Oh, thank you. The pleasure's all mine. Like I said, it's an honor. Like I I, I was thoroughly, thoroughly stoked and surprised when you reached out to me. So thank you're you. You're very welcome. No, you're very welcome, honestly. 